In the chaos of the historic Six-Day War between Israel and its Arab neighbors in 1967, a battle that would reshape the entire Middle East, unexpected spectators stood miles away in the island nation of Singapore. Amidst the clashing forces and the whirlwind of conflict, Singapore's leaders were not just passive observers, they were invested in a particular outcome. They were silently rooting for Israel to emerge victorious. But what could this seemingly distant war possibly have to do with a tiny Southeast Asian nation like Singapore? Join us as we uncover this mystery and its lasting impact on a nation striving to find its place on the world stage. Let's first step back to 1965 when Singapore was expelled from Malaysia. At that time, the odds seemed stacked against this young nation that gained independence against its will. The divorce from Malaysia was abrupt and unwanted, leaving Singapore without its essential economic support. To add to the predicament, the remnants of a recent communist insurgency still lingered in the air. Amid this chaos, President Sukarno's Indonesia was locking horns in a fierce military confrontation, also known as the Konfrontasi, branding Malaysia as a neo-colonialist construct. In the crosshairs of this conflict, Singapore found itself in the thick of it. To make matters more pressing, the Vietnam War was gaining momentum, casting an ominous shadow over the region. These early days of independence for Singapore were far from ideal. It was a precarious state of affairs that left Singapore's government with no choice but to swiftly establish a credible and independent defense capability. From day one, this became an existential priority. However, Singapore's defense setup post-independence was far from impressive. Its military comprised of just two understrength infantry battalions, with more than half of their soldiers made up of Malaysians who were given the option to either stay or return home. Unsurprisingly, most Malaysians chose to leave, left with only a handful of Singaporean ancillary units after most of the Malaysians departed. The city-state's military force was as minuscule as it could be. The military's arsenal was modest at best, a dilapidated wooden gunboat and not even a single aircraft to call their own. It was clear that Singapore had a long and arduous journey ahead in building up a robust defense force from practically nothing. But that's not all. While the British maintained a significant military presence in Singapore and Malaysia, winds of change were stirring in London. Pressure was mounting on the British to scale back their military presence in the region, and they were eyeing an exit strategy. Singapore had to come to terms with the possibility that the British might withdraw their military support at some point. This realization added yet another layer of urgency to Singapore's need for self-reliance. In the midst of this tumult, Singapore's founding father, Lee Kuan Yew, didn't mince words. He famously used the analogy of Singapore having to be a poisonous shrimp in a world where big fish devoured the small and the small preyed on the shrimp, alluding to the country's need to be a strong deterrent force in a world dominated by larger powers. Bold words, perhaps, but this notion set the tone for a defense strategy focused on deterrence that would shape Singapore's future. The urgency to strengthen Singapore's defense was undeniable, and so Go Keng Sui, serving as the finance minister, bravely stepped forward to face the challenge at hand. However, his familiarity with military affairs was limited to his time as a corporal in the Singapore Volunteer Corps during the British rule before the Japanese invasion in 1942. Motivated by the imperative to strengthen Singapore's defense, Go Keng Sui swiftly organized a small team to establish the new Ministry of Interior and Defense, which was later split into the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Home Affairs of today. The dilemma was real. Singapore, with its relatively small population and limited resources, couldn't sustain a large professional army. To circumvent this obstacle, the government initially experimented with the concept of a part-time volunteer army. Thus, the People's Defense Force emerged shortly after Singapore gained independence. However, the government grappled with the challenge of garnering enough volunteers. Several factors contributed to this, including the absence of a strong military tradition in Singapore, and the prevailing belief among the predominantly Chinese population that military service wasn't a desirable career path. Hence, this approach proved to be unsustainable in the long run. Confronted with this reality, Lee Kuan Yew turned to India and Egypt, perceived as the natural allies of the non-aligned world, in hopes of receiving support to bolster Singapore's defenses. However, after weeks of waiting, both countries failed to offer the much-needed assistance. With no other alternatives in sight, Lee Kuan Yew eventually granted Go Keng Sui permission to go with the final option, which was none other than Israel. Truth be told, Go Keng Sui had been marveling at Israel's impressive defense system during his visit to the country in 1959. Both nations, Singapore and Israel, were small in size, but situated in somewhat hostile regions. 
and Israel had been one of the earliest countries to recognize Singapore's sovereignty. General Zayavi, then serving as the Israel Defense Force's deputy head of the Operations Directorate, was dispatched to Singapore in October 1965. Under a cloak of secrecy, he embarked on a covert mission to meet with Go Keng Sui. Zayavi, always the consummate military strategist, roamed Singapore incognito by taxi to familiarize himself with the lay of the land and the local conditions. He returned to Tel Aviv with newfound insights. Back in Israel, Zayavi gathered a team that included Mayor Amit, the director of Mossad, their intelligence agency. Together, they embarked on an ambitious plan to develop the Singapore Armed Forces, or SAF in short. This master plan, also known as the Brown Book, was ready within a month and translated into English shortly after. The Brown Book covered a broad spectrum, from strategic considerations to doctrines. At its heart lay the realization that the only feasible solution for Singapore was to build a citizen army composed of conscripts and led by a small regular force. To make this vision a reality, the book proposed the establishment of an officer training school to train a corps of professional leaders. The backbone of this citizen army would be made up of citizen soldiers, ensuring that in times of crisis, the entire nation could be swiftly mobilized. The Brown Book meticulously outlined the steps needed to put this concept into action. One of the key objectives was to expand the army to 12 battalions within a decade, a feat achievable only through conscription. In the wake of this audacious plan, Singapore and Israel inked a one-page agreement, a pact that would change the course of Singapore's defense forever. The agreement was straightforward. Israel would provide defense advisors to Singapore, and in return, these advisors would receive salaries on par with their counterparts in Israel, along with accommodation and meals. In retrospect, these terms proved incredibly generous on Israel's part, but the benefits Singapore reaped from the invaluable counsel of the Israelis would be immeasurable. Yet the presence of Israeli military advisors in Singapore posed a political conundrum. Why, you may wonder? Well, the enduring Israeli-Palestinian conflict held significant emotional weight, especially among Southeast Asian Muslims, and Singapore couldn't afford to stir up tensions with its neighbors. Thus, the defense cooperation between Singapore and Israel was intentionally kept under wraps, hidden from the public eye for decades. Even now, this partnership is not often publicized despite its profound impact. This discreet approach was set in motion when a modest group of seven military advisors from the Israel Defense Forces, led by Colonel Yaakov Jack Elazari, landed in Singapore in November 1965. To mask their true identity, Singapore even went as far as referring to the Israelis as Mexicans. Yet this ruse did not impede the development of a meaningful cooperation between the two nations. Rabin, Israel's chief of staff, had outlined the mission for the team of advisors sent to Singapore. He emphasized that their goal wasn't to turn Singapore into an extension of Israel, but to impart the art of military prowess, enabling Singapore to stand on its own feet in managing its defense forces. The success of the Israeli team hinged on one critical measure, that Singapore would eventually take charge of its own army. Furthermore, the team was there not to issue commands, but to offer guidance. They were unequivocally not in the business of selling arms. When recommending specific procurements for Singapore, their advice was rooted in pure military judgment. Whether Singapore chose to purchase these items from Israel was inconsequential. When Elazari touched down in Singapore, following in Zevi's footsteps, he wasted no time in acquainting himself with the lay of the land. Steering himself across the island, he scouted potential locations for the proposed officer training school outlined in the Brown Book. Eventually, Elazari's gaze settled upon Pase Laba after ruling out Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tekong two islands northeast of the main island. His recommendations to Go Keng Sui were swiftly accepted, culminating in the birth of the Singapore Armed Forces Training Institute, or SAFT in short. In no time, bulldozers rumbled into action at Pasilaba. Within a year, the construction of SAFT, engineered with plans from the Israeli Engineering Corps, was complete. Despite its rudimentary design and basic facilities, SAFT stood as a testament to the urgent need to set the SAF in motion. SAFT became the epicenter of the Israeli advisors' mission. Their primary focus? To cultivate a pool of Singaporean instructors and commanders. They prioritized what they termed training the trainers, ensuring that Singapore officers absorbed their expertise swiftly to take over instructional roles. Every aspect of their work was closely shadowed by a Singapore counterpart, from platoon commanders to company commanders, all the way up to the esteemed position of Director General Staff. They even entrusted the officer cadets with the task of crafting instructional materials. 
Now let's flip the script because here's where the tale takes a dramatic twist. The Arab-Israeli Six-Day War erupted in June 1967, sending shockwaves across the globe. The war was a significant military confrontation between Israel and its neighboring Arab states, including Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Tensions had been simmering for years due to territorial disputes and political unrest. Egypt's blockade of the Straits of Tehran, the expulsion of United Nations emergency force troops from the Sinai Peninsula, and the mobilization of Arab forces all fueled the mounting pressure. Meanwhile, in a world away from the chaos unfolding in the Middle East, the watchful eyes of Lee Kuan Yew and his government were fixed on the events of the war. But why were they so concerned about a conflict thousands of kilometers from their nation's shores? The answer lies in the pivotal role the war's outcome would play in shaping the future of the SAF, especially considering the recent involvement of Israeli trainers in Singapore's military development and the crucial implementation of national service that same year, which was a transformative step in building Singapore's defense capabilities. Much to the relief of Singapore, in a mere six days, the Israeli forces delivered a staggering blow to the armies and air forces of the Arab states and emerged victorious. As a result, Israel's territorial control expanded exponentially, encompassing the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and even East Jerusalem. Lee Kuan Yew's autobiography reflected his relief at Israel's resounding victory in the Six-Day War. He acknowledged that a defeat for the Israelis could have severely shaken the confidence of the SAF in their Israeli mentors. The stunning triumph of Israel against the combined forces of the Arab states also served as a testament to the wisdom behind Singapore's choice of Israel as its defense partner. As the dust settled from the aftermath of the Six-Day War, the bond between Israel and Singapore in matters of military cooperation only grew stronger. Inspired by the resounding success of Israel's formidable armored divisions during the conflict, Singapore made a pivotal move in January 1968 to fortify its own armored corps. This strategic decision led to the procurement of 72 AMX-13 light tanks from Israel, a bold step that significantly bolstered Singapore's military might, especially in comparison to its neighbor Malaysia, which lacked any tanks at the time. But it wasn't just about acquiring tanks, Singapore was determined to master the art of tank warfare. A pioneering group of 36 Singapore armor officers underwent rigorous training in the intricacies of operating the AMX-13 and understanding the nuances of tank warfare. These intense training sessions, conducted at a discrete location, were facilitated by Israeli experts, underscoring the depth of the partnership between the two nations. While solidifying its ground forces, Singapore also set its sights on developing a modern and sophisticated air force. The stunning triumph of the Israeli Air Force during the Six-Day War, particularly in the initial airstrike that decimated the air fleets of neighboring Arab nations, served as a powerful impetus for Singapore's aspirations. Recognizing the need for expertise, Adam Tsivoni, a retired Israeli Air Force colonel, was enlisted in 1968 to aid in the establishment of Singapore's Air Force. This marked the birth of the Singapore Air Defense Command, a precursor to the Republic of Singapore Air Force, officially established in September 1968. From the later part of the 1960s onwards, the relationship between Singapore and Israel extended beyond military collaboration, encompassing trade, technology, and cultural exchanges. Yet, the linchpin of this enduring bond remains rooted in defense, heavily influenced by Israel's extensive battlefield expertise and triumphs over the years. Today, the SAF boasts an array of cutting-edge Israeli military equipment, including the Heron 1 unmanned air vehicles, the Spider air defense system, and the Spike anti-tank guided missile system. Clearly, Israel's critical role in bolstering Singapore's military capabilities, especially during its formative years, cannot be understated. While the Israel-Arab War in 1967 influenced how Singapore shaped its military strategy, did you know that another war that broke out in October 2023, this time between Israel and Hamas, could also have profound implications for Singapore? Watch this video to find out more.